So welcome everybody to the today's seminar. We start uh, immediately. The today's seminar is a, somehow an internal seminar in the sense that the speaker is uh, from the Research Center of Astronomy, Stavros Pastras. Uh, practically, the talk uh, is uh, the presentation of his uh, master thesis. Uh, he finished successfully with uh, his studies for the master's degree at the University of Athens uh, quite recently. Uh, you, that's why the name of the supervisors uh, on the first slide. Uh, you see the title of the talk, you have already received that in the, in the email gas flows in Bart's parallel galaxies by means of two different hydrocodes. So, so just to say that uh, Stavros will be starting his PhD thesis at, uh, in Garching, uh, joint collaboration of the two Max Planck Institutes there from next September. So Stavros, you may start. So hi everyone, I'm Stavros and uh, as Dr. Patsis had just mentioned, this will be- uh, Speak louder. Oh, okay. Uh, this will be a brief presentation of the research I have been carrying out in the context of my master's thesis at the Research Center for Astronomy of the Academy of Athens. Uh, my talk will be on gas flows in Bart's parallel galaxies by means of two different hydrocodes. I will specifically focus on applications to Bart potentials. Uh, so let me start um, with an overview of my presentation. I will start by introducing you to the topic at hand, uh, specifically Bart galaxies and uh, ways of uh, simulating their gas. Uh, I will move on to the motivation, uh, the reason why we carried out uh, this study. Uh, then I will focus on the methodology, that is the codes and the methods we used uh, to simulate uh, the gas of these galaxies. And uh, then I will move on to two applications, uh, to two bar potentials. The first one is the well-studied first bar potential. And the second one is a potential a Fourier series type of potential. And finally, I will sum up my conclusions. So starting with the, with the introduction, as we're going to talk about galaxies, uh, the first slide is about the Hubble's tuning fork. This is the first uh, attempt at the classification of galaxies according to their morphological features. And uh, on the left side of this uh, diagram, you can see the elliptical galaxies, uh, the early type galaxies. And on the right side, you can see the spiral galaxies or uh, late type galaxies. At the upper right uh, side, you see the non-bar spiral galaxies and uh, at the lower uh, right side, you see the bar spiral galaxies, which are going to be the topic of today's talk. So uh, uh, bar uh, spiral galaxies are these galaxies. And uh, as all galaxies, they are gravitationally bound systems of stars, dust, uh, gas, and uh, dark matter. Uh, we are going, uh, I'm going here to present to you the axisymmetric part, uh, the axisymmetric part of their components uh, that are the bulbs that lie at the center of the galaxy. Uh, there are disks that consist of stars, dust, and gas uh, that can be thought of as a, a two-dimensional structure as they are usually very thin. Um, taking into account what we know about our own galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, we think that there are globular clusters around the bulbs and uh, the area of the disk. And finally, all these systems are embedded in uh, large uh, halos of dark matter that uh, extend to great radii from the center of the galaxies. Uh, in this cartoon on uh, the right side of the screen, you can see some uh, spirals that are, of course, non axisymmetric terms, but are there for, uh, you know, just uh, for show. So uh, the non axisymmetric non terms of uh, the bar galaxies are the bars that uh, uh, make these galaxies uh, being barred galaxies. Um, uh, barred uh, spiral, barred gal uh, okay. So uh, a significant proportion of uh, spiral galaxies are barred spiral galaxies, uh, approximately two thirds uh, of all these galaxies. And uh, that is why they are abundant in both observations. And you can see at the lower uh, right side of the screen and then body simulations. Frankly, in end body simulations, simulations it is difficult to um, avoid the bar instabilities that lead to the formation of the bars. Uh, bar galaxies have some very distinctive uh, morphological features that are their bars that you can see here and here that are made out of stars. And uh, a very uh, a distinctive morphological feature, gas morphological feature are the dustlin socks that you can see here and here. 
the dazzling socks are uh, the local maxima of the gas density uh, that are found after uh, the uh, the local minima of uh, the potential well that lie across uh, along the, the major semi-axis of the bar. And um, this is where, uh, due to uh, the high concentration of gas, we find there a high concentration of dust, uh, resulting in the, appearance, in the appearance of dust lanes in um, pictures of galaxies in uh, optical wavelengths. Um, so, uh, what we are trying to do is model uh, bar spiral galaxies, and specifically their gas. Their gas is a, a continuous uh, medium. Uh, this is why in order to simulate it and um, uh, study it, we first need to discretize it. Uh, this is done in mainly two ways, uh, following two approaches. The first one is the mesh discretization approach, according to which we apply a grid uh, a mesh uh, at uh, the area of interest, and we calculate the quantities of the uh, fluid at uh, the cells of this grid. The other approach is the particle discretization approach, according to which we replace the continuous medium uh, with uh, discrete particles that have certain properties that mimic uh, the behavior of the fluid. Uh, the mesh discretization is followed, uh, is used in the Eulerian approach, while the particle discretization is used in the Lagrangian approach. So uh, the Eulerian uh, hydrocodes, uh, which are the first attempt at solving uh, all these equations in order to simulate fluids, use um, the mesh discretization. Uh, specifically, these codes generate a mesh um, uh, extending through the whole uh, area of interest. And uh, the, part the properties of the fluid are calculated at the cell, at each cell of this mesh. Uh, each cell interacts with its neighbors, uh, exchanging mass, uh, momentum, and energy. And um, th this is how the fluid is evolved. Uh, these codes uh, have some uh, upsides and, and some downsides. Um, a, a, a good feature of theirs is that uh, they're computationally fast. However, uh, if we need to, uh, to have a high resolution uh, across uh, in specific regions, we need to create a very fine mesh that would lead to a very intensive, computationally very intensive calculations. Uh, this problem uh, has been addressed uh, with the introduction of uh, the adaptive mesh refinement that works as follows. Uh, through the whole uh, area of interest, a coarse grid is applied. And then according to some conditions that may be the spatial derivatives of uh, the quantities of the fluid, uh, some specific cells can be further refined uh, with the creation of uh, several uh, levels of refinement that are grids with finer resolution. Um, that leads uh, here on the right side of your screen, you can see what this leads to, the coarse grid and two subsequent levels of refinement. Um, that gives us the image you can see now on your screen, uh, which is a grid uh, with uh, adaptive refinement and high resolution in uh, areas where we want higher resolution or we have greater volatility. So uh, the second approach is the Lagrangian approach. Um, Can I have a question here? Yes, Could you give of course. The, uh, previous slide, please? Yes. So uh, I saw this from the beginning as well. Uh, what was the rationale for defining such an adaptive mesh? Uh, is this uh, evolutionary? So do you change it along the, uh, the yeah. simulation or? Is it just an example and you change it, you evolve it? How does it work? Okay, uh, this specific image is an example, but uh, in reality, the grid, the grid is refined or uh, its refinement is done backwards. It's um, it, The grid we use is coarser or finer according to the evolution of the simulation. Uh, specifically in our simulations, uh, if the velocity, the density or the pressure is, uh, the, the difference of velocity, uh, density or pressure is uh, there's a change in these quantities of 5% between two neighboring cells, uh, these cells are refined okay, in so order to achieve is, greater resolution. This is dynamic. Yes, this is dynamic, of course. After each step, uh, the condition of the grid is reevaluated and it's refined or otherwise, accordingly. Uh, so uh, the next approach is the Lagrangian approach uh, or uh, the smooth uh, particle hydrodynamics one. Uh, according to this scheme, uh, the fluid is uh, simulated via SPH particles that carry the properties of the fluid. Uh, and uh, the physical properties of the fluid are interpolated in uh, a point where we want to um, uh, compute uh, these quantities uh, according to a smoothing kernel. This is done in the following way. So let's say that we want uh, to uh, compute uh, a quantity of the fuel at, uh, of the fluid at uh, the point A. 
what we do is first uh, we determine the, the SPH particles that lie within a radius of uh, a smoothing length from this point. Uh, then we calculate the value of the smoothing kernel, that is the function you can see here, at the locations of the points that will contribute to the quantity of the fluid at uh, point A. And then uh, the quantity of the fluid is the weighted sum of all of these contributions. This way we can simulate uh, a continuous medium with uh, distinct particles. So uh, having introduced you to the topic, uh, we can move on towards describing our motivation for carrying out this study. Uh, our ultimate goal is to study uh, the global star formation on disks of uh, both non-barred and barred spiral galaxies. As star formation is expected to take place in high gas density regions, uh, studying the flow of gas is an important step, toward, an important step towards achieving our goal. Uh, an aspect of the galaxy that influences greatly uh, the flow of gas in its disk is whether this galaxy is barred or not. That's why on the left side of the screen, you can see a non-barred uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, this is the typical image of star formation in spiral galaxies that we have today. Uh, that is that the material flows uh, across the spiral pattern. Uh, the gas um, condenses uh, along uh, the spiral patterns and the density increases and stars are formed. However, simulations have shown that in the cases of barred spiral galaxies, the material flows along the spiral arms. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, no. Okay, here you go. So um, the star formation process, processes uh, in the latter case have not been studied, and that's what we aim to eventually do. So uh, the second goal of our study is the comparison of Eulerian and Lagrangian hydrocodes. Uh, while uh, Eulerian hydrocodes uh, generate uh, a mess with uh, a grid of cells uh, with a fluid flowing through each one of those cells, uh, the Lagrangian hydrocodes uh, sort of follow the flow with the infinitesimal fluid element moving along a streamline with a velocity equal to the local flow velocity at each point. Uh, our, in the course of our study, we will attempt to find out if there are any codependent morphological features. And to that end, we will use Ramses as a typical Eulerian hydrocode, and then SPH code is a typical example of a Lagrangian hydrocode. So let's move on to the codes we used. Um, the first one, we used three codes uh, in total. The first one is uh, the Eulerian hydrocode Ramses, which is developed main, uh, mainly by Roman Tessier. Uh, to which we have applied approximately 3,000 lines of patches and uh, some simple bug fixes in order to uh, fix some crashes uh, in cases of uh, two-dimensional simulations that are the simulations we run. The second code is an SPH code uh, that is based on the theoretical work of Lucy and Ginkle and Monaghan, uh, to which we have added some SPH particle replenishment capabilities that we are going to talk, uh, to talk at greater detail in the following slides. And finally, uh, there's a, a tool that uh, we developed for the needs of this project, which is called the CL Integrate. Uh, it is uh, a stellar response uh, integrator that runs concurrently on both CPUs and GPUs. Uh, while this uh, tool is uh, technically uh, a bit more advanced, uh, its uh, physical concept is uh, pretty easy. Actually, uh, stars are considered to be test particles and uh, their orbits are uh, found through the integration of the equations of motions. So uh, in the following slides, I will focus on the replenishment we added to the SPH code. So let's talk about some disadvantages of SPH. Uh, the key disadvantage that uh, affects our simulations is uh, the, re uh, the reduction in effective uh, resolution throughout the evolution of a model. That is uh, caused by two factors. The one is that uh, SPH particles can escape the area of interest due to uh, them being on escape trajectories or uh, the uh, go out of the area of interest and return in very large times, so they're, pla they're practically lost. Uh, the other way uh, they are lost is uh, through clamping, uh, which is their tendency to cramp themselves into regions of high, um, into high density regions. Uh, in order to illustrate this, on the right side of your screen, I am showing you a snapshot, an SP snapshot of uh, snapshot of a PhD thesis of Line in 1996. Uh, here you can see a a response, a gas response uh, of a galaxy that we are going to study also. And uh, you can see that uh, this is a beautiful uh, snapshot. While uh, a bit later, we have this image where the spiral lamps are no longer discernible. And uh, the particles in the central regions of the galaxy have crammed, have crammed themselves into clumps, reducing the resolution. 
So uh, we need to address these issues. The first issue can be easily addressed by relocating the particles that um, that escape the area of interest inside the area of interest randomly with a velocity so uh, so that they if uh, so that they will perform a uniform circular motion around the center of the galaxy, uh, considering only the axisymmetric part of the potential. Uh, by adding this, um, let's say, resuffling of particles, uh, we can go from this image to this image. I would like to point out that uh, the rotation in our case is done counterclockwise, so the spiral lamps are at the other um, at the other direction. But uh, the spiral lamps are discernible, and uh, you can see in the central region that there is still clamping, and the solving clamping is not that uh, trivial. So. Uh, clamping is a major problem. Uh, as I've already said, clamps are areas with a high numerical density of SPH particles. And this is a problem because, as we said earlier, uh, the way the properties of the fluid are interpolated is uh, by calculating the contributions of all particles that lie inside uh, a smoothing length from the point where we need uh, the properties of the fluid. So if there are many particles close to each other, the calculations uh, involve many SPH particles, and thus be, uh, the calculations are very intensive. So, uh, for example, this model that uh, I'm showing you on the right side of, you, of your screen uh, was practically unable to evolve to evolve after this point. So, this is an issue that uh, we need to address. A first attempt at uh, addressing this issue was done by um, toggling the parameters of the SP simulation. That is, for example, by increasing the sound speed. Uh, by increasing the sound speed, we increase the temperature of the gas and the internal energy of the gas. That uh, So we increase the ability of the gas to resist to its cramming into uh, high density regions. Uh, another parameter that uh, we uh, altered is uh, are the viscosity, uh, are the artificial viscosity parameters. Uh, these parameters are crucial for an SP simulation as they are uh, required for uh, the accurate simulating of a fluid. Um, their values and how exactly we are going to implement artificial viscosity is a topic uh, of ongoing research. But uh, the current consensus is that uh, we should use uh, the parameters that work better for uh, our simulation, the simulation that we have at hand. So uh, in our case, we reduced uh, the parameters from uh, the values of 1 and 2 to 0 0.5 and 1 in order to make our uh, fluid less viscous and uh, less prone to clamping. Uh, this led, uh, this transformed this image into this image. Here we can still see some uh, the spiral alarms, and we can see that the clamps seem a little bit more uh, dissolved, but uh, there is still uh, a problem. So finally, uh, as a solution to this problem, we propose uh, SPH replenishment. According to this scheme, uh, we follow the following procedure. First, uh, we generate a Cartesian grid in the area of interest and we count the number of, par of SPH particles in each one of the cells of this grid. If this number exceeds a predefined threshold, uh, the, the, each particle of uh, the cells that are uh, considered too dense um, has a 50% chance of being relocated, or of being relocated ac according to the relocation we did with uh, the particles that escaped the area of uh, interest. So uh, this led, uh, this transformed the image you can see on your screen into this image. Here we can clearly see the spiral alarms and we can see uh, some very interesting structure in the central areas of the galaxy. Uh, I would also like to point out that it, this uh, picture is pretty stable as um, it uh, practically remains the same no matter how long we continue integrating and evolving our system. So, Okay, so uh, moving on, I would like to uh, talk about the initial conditions and assumptions of our simulations. Uh, I would like to first point out that uh, our goal is not to realistically model a specific galaxy, uh, but it is instead to study the responses of gas and stars to the, to the potentials of barred galaxies. So in both stellar and uh, gas responses, in, uh, instead of uh, using an exponential profile as uh, initial conditions, we used a homogeneous disk, uh, we used a homogeneous disk instead. Uh, in addition, we introduced uh, the perturbation of the potential during uh, gradually during a growing phase of three pattern rotations. And uh, finally, throughout our simulations, uh, our gas remained isothermal. So uh, I would also like to talk about the system of units uh, briefly. As we're talking about galactic uh, simulations, the unit of length is of course one kiloparsec. Uh, our velocity, the unit of our velocity due to um, 
the units of some coefficients we used uh, was determined, uh, we needed it to be one kilometer per second. Uh, this uh, caused the unit of time to be approximately one giga year, and this we needed the gravitational constant to be one. Uh, we got uh, the rest of the units that you can see on the table on the right side of your screen. So uh, it's time to move on to uh, the first application of our methods, uh, that is to the first bar potential. The first bar potential is uh, the result of a triaxial ellipsoid with a density given by the formulas you can see on your screen. R0 is the density at the center of the ellipsoid, while uh, that is, uh, in our case, non-homogeneous due to this exponent being one that is other than zero, and z being a function of x, y, and z. Uh, in addition, we placed the same, uh, the major semi-axis uh, of the ellipsoid along the y-axis. That's why a is greater than b. We chose this potential as it is a well-studied potential of non-orbital properties. Uh, we studied this from, uh, by Athanasula in 1992 and Pats in 2005. Uh, thus, uh, we pretty much know what to expect. So we can uh, model uh, the gas and stellar responses using uh, both Lagrangian and Eulerian hydrocodes and compare the results. Uh, I will focus specifically on three topics, uh, on three aspects of this potential, specifically the dazzling shocks and the infield they cause, the comparison of the two hydrocodes, and the dependence on parameters such as uh, the sound speed and the, the parameters of the potential. So on this slide, on the left side of your screen, you are going to see the stellar response to this potential, while on the right one, you are going to see uh, a density map of the gas response to the potential. Uh, you can see that uh, in the stellar responses, uh, the, the bar is clearly discernible, while in the gas responses, we can see an envelope surrounding the bar. We can also see the central region of uh, the potential and the dust lane shocks that are very characteristic. Uh, I, would also, I would like to focus uh, on these dust lane shocks. So on this slide, on the left side of your screen, you are going to see a density map uh, of the model we saw previously. While on the right, we will see um, a set of uh, physical quantities across this line. Uh, this line is placed so that it is perpendicular to one of the dust lane shocks, and it starts on the right-hand side. Uh, the quantities we are going to see are the density, the pressure, uh, the velocity of the material parallel to this line, and the velocity jump at the location of the dust lane shock. That is the change of the parallel velocity right before and right after the dust lane shock. As the simulation moves on, uh, we can see that the dust lane shock is clearly visible as a spike in both the density and pressure profiles. Well, I apologize for the resolution, it's uh, quite low in, uh, in, uh, in this screen. Uh, not that much. It's, uh, this video is very high resolution, so if you don't have a high resolution display, some things will be cropped out. Uh, okay, so we can uh, look at the dust lane shocks easily, and we can also see that there is a, a significant velocity jump at the location of the dust lane shocks, uh, of the dust lane shock. Uh, in addition, I would like to point out that uh, from um, the morphology of these two uh, profiles, you can see that our gas is indeed uh, isothermal, as uh, pressure and density are proportional. Uh, as the simulation moves on, we can see that uh, the you know, velocity jump at the location of the shock uh, has a value of approximately 95 kilometers per second. That is in agreement with uh, the study of Athanasula in 1992. So uh, as the gas meets the dust lane shock, uh, it loses angular momentum and gets funneled towards the central region of the galaxy, where it forms two uh, interesting morphologies, a leading spiral, uh, spiral at the inner inner Limbland resonance and a trailing spiral at the outer inner Limbland resonance. Both of these morphologies are compatible with the underlying orbital dynamics in the central region and can be explained uh, by orbital theory. So uh, let's move on to the code comparison part of our study. On the left side of your screen, you can see uh, a, a map of the count of SPH particles in a 256 by 256 grid. And on the right side, uh, you can see the density map of uh, the Eulerian hydrocode Ramses. We can see that uh, in both cases, the morphological features are pretty much identical with the central regions, the envelope surrounding the bar, and the outer regions of the galaxy being practically the same. However, it is, is, we can easily see that um, while the SPH code uh, provides us with the high resolution in high uh, gas density regions, uh, the Eulerian hydrocode provides us with a high resolution in low gas density regions. Uh, please keep in mind that uh, for the simulation that you can see on the left, you used 
40,000 SPH particles, while for uh, the Eulerian simulation on the right, we used 16 million uh, cells. So uh, the fact that we can see here a bit of a spiral pattern in the center of the galaxy is uh, representative of uh, the difference, the, the different way SPH and uh, Eulerian hydrocodes treat uh, regions of high and low gas density, respectively. So uh, we don't just uh, want the morphologies uh, of the of the gas, the, where are the maxima of the density, but we also need the um, the direction of the flow uh, of the gas. That's why we have plotted the the velocity fields in both. Uh, cases of uh, the SPH and the, the Eulerian hydrocode, uh, we can see that uh, the, the velocity fields in the central region of uh, the potential, the region surrounding the bar, and the outskirts of the galaxy are pretty much identical. So uh, having established a consensus between our two hydrocodes, we can move on to towards studying the dependence of um, our uh, responses on parameters such as the sound speed, for example, that controls the temperature of the gas. Uh, that's why in this slide, I'm going to show you uh, three responses of the same model with the uh, sound speed increasing from left to right from 10 to 20 and uh, eventually 30 kilometers per second. Um, as we let our models evolve, we can see that in the case of uh, 20 kilometers per second, uh, the dust and shocks are stronger and gas gets funneled quicker towards the center of the galaxy. Uh, and uh, the, the envelope surrounding the bar diminishes um, in comparison to uh, the case of 10 kilometers per second. And finally, in the case of uh, a sound speed of 30 kilometers per second, we can see that the dust and shocks become even stronger and the morphology at the center of the galaxy, uh, of the central region, changes dramatically. In addition, we can study the dependence on uh, parameters of the potential uh, following the study of uh, Afanasula in 1992. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to present you on the right side of the screen a case with a significantly lower central concentration. Uh, and you can see that uh, the morphology of the central region and the bar in general changes uh, significantly. So we can also uh, uh, vary the axial ratio of the bar, uh, and uh, on the in the case of, on, on the right, you can see a model with a significantly higher axial ratio. So we expect the ellipticity of the central region to be considerably higher, and you can see that the morphology changes uh, to a great extent. Finally, we can also um, study the role of the bar of the strength of the bar perturbation that is monitored through that's controlled through the quadruple momentum, uh, and we can see that if we introduce a weaker bar perturbation, the morphology of the dust lane socks uh, change with uh, the dust lane socks becoming curved. All of these assumptions uh, are compatible uh, with uh, the study of uh, Dr. Athanasula in 1992. So. Uh, uh, by getting similar, uh, the same results, uh, we have established that uh, our hydrocodes work as expected. Thus, we can move on towards uh, the second, um, uh, the second uh, uh, part uh, of our uh, applications to a Fourier series potential. Uh, these potentials are usually obtained from near infrared images of galaxies and uh, are described by the formulas you can see on your screen. Uh, the one we chose for our study is one characterized by non-standard orbital dynamics, and uh, it is a, a potential that has been proposed for NGC 7479 by Quillen. And on the right side of your screen, you can see some isocontours of uh, the effective potential, uh, a, assuming a pattern speed of approximately 27 kilometers per second uh, per kiloparsec. I would also like to point out that our results uh, of uh, the study of this potential uh, have, be, uh, are, have been uh, submitted and are currently under review. So uh, again, on the left side of the screen, uh, we're going to see uh, the stellar responses to this potential, while on the right one, uh, we're going to see the gas responses. Uh, as in all other cases, we introduced uh, the perturbation of the potential uh, gradually during a growing phase of approximately three pattern rotations. And uh, here you can see the growing phase. And exactly after, uh, we spotted a period of high volatility. After a semi-stable response was established, we got the response cycle you can see on your screen. Uh, for the gas, we have a response cycle uh, characterized by strong dust lane shocks that you can see here. And the stellar response is dominated by the bar and uh, an envelope surrounding it. 
in order to get more information, this is not visible at all. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, in order to get more information, I have plotted here the uh, stellar response, the uh, response of the Eulerian hydrocode Ramses, and here the SPH uh, response, which is non discernible right now. Okay, anyway, uh, what we see is that uh, uh, at the locations of the dust in socks, the gas flows towards the center of the galaxy, and uh, there seem to be two uh, features resembling the capital Greek letter gamma around uh, the center and bifurcating from uh, the ends of the dust lane socks. Um, this, is, uh, this result is in agreement with the SPH code. And uh, in order to get more information, we can plot uh, and start the correlation uh, between the uh, stellar responses and the gas responses. We can plot uh, the stellar responses over the gas responses. And come on. Okay, so I'm zoomed here. Okay. Let me see now. Okay, so here we go. We have the SPH response too. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can see that there's a, an agreement between the two hydro codes uh, and uh, these gamma tails bifurcating from the, uh, from the ends of the dust lane socks. Uh, appear in both cases. We can also see an extension uh, of the dust lane socks that uh, goes across this direction. So, as we said, as I said, we can uh, plot uh, the stellar responses or the stellar response over the gas response, and we get this image uh, that, uh, and we can see that it appears uh, that there appears to be a good correlation between the orbital dynamics of the potential and the gas flow as the gas seems to avoid the areas of orbits with big loops near the ends of the bar. And, um, and this is a very interesting find. However, this could be uh, a, something specific to the snapshot we took. That's why uh, here I'm going to present to you a response, uh, the whole response cycle of the model with uh, a zoomed in uh, view of the area of interest uh, with the velocity fields plotted and the red dots representing the stellar particles uh, of this region. So here you can see, uh, okay, you can see the result of the simulation. Uh, we can see that there is gas streaming towards the end of the dust lane soak uh, from this uh, gamma-like feature. And uh, it, uh, uh, the, the gas density increases in the region at the end of the dust lane soak and eventually uh, this region sort of bursts uh, and the gas moves towards the upper part of the gamma structure that uh, bifurcates from the other dust lane socks, uh, dust lane soak. Then the gas streams across, uh, along uh, this gamma-like this gamma feature towards the central region. Can I ask something? Yes. You, you talk about charge there. Uh, yeah. In what sense? Are these material uh, supersonic in any way? How is the shock formed in this situation? Okay, uh, the, at the location of the dust uh, of the dust socks that uh, we have uh, studied, uh, we can we see these um, a very large uh, decrease in uh, radial in radial velocity. Uh, sorry, no, uh, in tangential velocity, um, and uh, and uh, the gas loses angular momentum and flows towards the center of the galaxy. So, in that sense, yes, there is a shock there. So, well. As I understand yeah. it, when you when you define a shock, then you have a threshold, uh, and in cases like this, uh, or in similar cases at least, the threshold is a characteristic speed of the material. Yeah. And right. as a characteristic speed, I can only think of the speed the speed of sound. Yeah. So if there is a front uh, between which one side of it has a subsonic speed and another side of it has a supersonic speed, then I expect a shock being formed yeah. right there. Do you have the situation there? Yeah. So you have some supersonic material and some subsonic material. Yeah, that happens at the location of the dust lane socks. Okay, that's, so, that's how you define the shock. Yeah. So hey. supersonic versus subsonic, and this creates this gradient of, of velocity right there. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, we haven't. Uh, sp well, I at least haven't specified uh, exactly a, a threshold, the numerical threshold. But uh, yeah, there is a very, uh, as I saw uh, earlier, there is a very steep decrease in uh, the velocity at these locations. Ah, where's the pointer? Here. Okay. So this is how we define the shock. Yes, it could be a shock versus a gradient, a steep gradient. 
Okay, so, uh, we know that the death. No, no, no. It's a real shock. I did try in '92, and it was a real shock. Okay, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, uh, but again, uh, we see some trains and passings of the gas uh, through the areas of the big loops of big of orbits to big loops near the ends of the bar, and. Um, uh, so, in order to establish that this is not, uh, you know, something that uh, an impression of ours, uh, looking at the responses of the gas, uh, we have plotted this image, that is the mean gas response. Uh, well, to what sense? Uh, each pixel of this uh, of this image is uh, the, the mean of 100 snapshots of this simulation, of, of the same pixel of 100 snapshots of this simulation. So, what we do is we stack actually 100 snapshots of this simulation. And we can see uh, this mean response. So we can clearly see that uh, the gas response cycle is dominated by strong dust clean socks and these gamma-like features that we're talking about. And in addition, the, uh, the areas of big loops near the ends of the bar have uh, systematically uh, lower, uh, lower uh, gas density than their surroundings. So uh, what we're seeing is actually there. Um, and another interesting uh, thing is uh, the velocity field of the mean gas response. Uh, we can see that uh, the gas uh, flows towards the end of the dust lane soak and then uh, moves around the area of, uh, the, of the orbits with big loops near the ends of the bar and gets funneled uh, following the gamma-like structure uh, towards uh, the other side uh, of the bar. Uh, in addition, there is a point here where, the, where from the left of it, uh, the gas flows inwards, while from the right, it um, flows along the banana-like, uh, the uh, locations of the banana-like banana orbits around uh, the Lagrangian point N4. So uh, this find is consistent uh, and in agreement uh, between the, there's agreement between uh, the two codes, as we can see practically the same uh, exact response uh, from uh, the SPH code. Uh, in addition, uh, as uh, the mean uh, response of RAMS is, is in agreement with uh, the SPH response, we can see that uh, SPH particle replacement seems to be a quick way to prov that provides us with the mean response uh, of the gas to a potential. Okay, so uh, we don't uh, just aim to describe uh, the flow of gas uh, in this potential. We we would also like to study its correlation of uh, its correlation with the stellar uh, responses and uh, sort of explain it. So that's why on this uh, slide they have plotted the characteristic uh, of uh, two of the main families that uh, play an important role uh, important role for this uh, response. Uh, these are the X1 and D families. The F family is a four to one resonance family that we can see that is stable up to an energy very close to the energy of the L1 Lagrangian point. And from that point on, it uh, becomes unstable as uh, you can see uh, from uh, the red color uh, that it is plotted with. Uh, and uh, the X1 family uh, from that point on uh, consists of uh, orbits that are caspy or have um, developed loops at uh, the RAPO centers. So um, in order to uh, study the correlation between the responses and uh, so uh, as we know in a galaxy gas doesn't follow periodic orbits, however their presence and the morphology shape uh, the gas response to a great extent. That's why on this slide uh, we have plotted some uh, periodic orbits. On the left side you can see uh, some stable X1 orbits that are potentially bar supporting and uh, an unstable F orbit. Um, in the middle, you can see some stable uh, F orbits and uh, again, the unstable uh, F61 orbit. And on the right side, you can see an assortment of orbits with loops. Uh, these orbits are characteristic, characteristic of this potential. And these are the ones that cause the response to, the, to this potential to differ from the responses to similar potentials. So uh, in order to start the correlation with the gas responses, we have plotted these orbits uh, over uh, a snapshot of uh, the SPH code. Uh, we can see that the dust lane socks, um, the, the, the dust lane socks are located across uh, the cusps of uh, the X1 orbits. And uh, when the X1 orbits start to develop loops, uh, the, gas, the gas flow seems to uh, go to avoid these regions and sort of turn. 
Uh, so the uh, locations of uh, the orbits could be loops near the ends of the bar remain uh, in areas with uh, low uh, gas density. This is a very interesting find. So uh, periodic orbits are not the only orbits uh, worth mentioning. Sticky non-periodic ones are important too. Uh, sticky orbits can behave as quasi-periodic orbits for large amounts of time, and uh, but eventually they get uh, dissolved into all uh, the available uh, phase space. On the left side of your screen, uh, we have plotted some unstable uh, and unstable f-periodic orbit and some uh, sticky non-periodic orbits around it. These are the orbits that support the envelope uh, surrounding the bar that can be thought of as a second bar surrounding the main one. Uh, in the middle, you can see some uh, sticky non-periodic orbits that escape the potential well after a relatively small amount of time. And on the right, you can see a Poincaré section. Uh, the void on the left side of the section is uh, artificial as we have not plotted the retrograde X4 orbits, uh, but on the right side, the void is, uh, uh, is, uh, has a physical meaning, and this, it's due to these orbits that um, uh, cross uh, the, our cross surface uh, one time, one, once or twice, and uh, then their next cross is at very high, um, very high radii from, uh, from the center of the galaxy, and uh, cannot, be in, cannot be included in this plot. So uh, let me, moving towards the end of my talk, let me sum up the conclusions of uh, our study. Uh, with regards to the, code, the comparison of the Illyrian uh, and Lagrangian hydro codes, we can see that there's a general, while there's a general agreement between the two approaches, both are needed in order to have a global view of the details of gas flow because they treat differently high and low gas density regions. Uh, in addition, SPH particle replacement seem, seems promising as it seems to be a way, a quick and computationally cheap way of getting the mean response uh, to a potential. Uh, when it comes to the first part potential, uh, we can see that the gas loses angular momentum at the dazzling shocks and gets funneled towards the central areas of the galaxy. And uh, the orbital dynamics of the central regions uh, causes the gas to form a leading and a trailing spiral. And finally, the gas response morphologies vary significantly with relation to the sound speed and the parameters of the potential, exactly described by Dr. Athanasula in 1992. Uh, finally, um, our second application on the Fourier series potential proposed for NGC 7479 uh, showed us that uh, there's a good correlation between st uh, stellar and gas responses. Uh, there's a chaotic bar surrounding uh, the main X1 bar. And in addition, the gas flow tends to avoid areas of orbits with big loops near the ends of the bar. Uh, this last conclusion is uh, the main uh, conclusion of a paper we have submitted for peer review. So that's all, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stavros. It's time for questions. Uh, first from the audience here, someone. Okay, let's start from Manolis and we go like this. Thank you. Uh, very nice, uh, very interesting work. Uh, congratulations uh, for finishing it successfully. So the new element of this work is the uh, uh, conclusion that you had in the last line, which is the uh, subject of a paper that has been submitted, as I understand. Okay? Yeah. All right. So let me ask this. Uh, First, this is a two-dimensional simulation, right? You do not move into three, day, three dimensions. No, no. Okay. Then there is no magnetic field uh, into there. You do not take into account magnetic field. This is just hydrodynamic codes. Yes. Okay. And then do you understand, do I understand it correctly that when you have the stellar response, as you call it, mm -hmm. the bars are more pronounced uh, than when you have just the gas response? In which case you see some structure in there that does not give you the direct impression of a bar, uh, which you get, for example, if you have stars instead of responses in there. Yeah. Do I understand this correctly? Is this one of your conclusions, or uh, there are more into that? Well, yes, uh, there is more into that. Uh, in stellar responses, yeah, you get the you get the bar. The bar is supported by X1 orbits, and uh, uh, well. Periodic orbits do not exist in a galaxy, but there are orbits uh, in the invariant curves around periodic orbits. And yes, you have the clear outline of the bar. Uh, in gas responses, uh, things change. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is a difference. Uh, 
and uh, exactly the morphology of uh, the gas responses in uh, bar potentials is described in the papers of uh, Dr. Alfonso in 1992. So yeah, there's a difference and uh, the most important morphology that we get in uh, bar potential, bar potentials in uh, the areas of the bar are the dazzling socks when it comes to gas. When it comes to sterile responses, yes, we get the outline of the bar. Let me add something on that. These dust lens shocks, as they are called, are a feature of, of the gas and also of the young stuff that you see. So you see that mainly in uh, optical images of the galaxies. If you go to the near infrared images from which you get, you estimate the potential, these features are not there, of course, you have just a bar. Okay. And this, this directly reflects to any kind of modeling, like these response models or the M-body models or whatever, is this clear uh, difference in the morphology of the snapshots. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, Mirella. This is a very interesting uh, study and uh, very well presented. So, congratulations. Uh, you have studied the orbits that around the bar, and you said that they are chaotic orbits around the X1, uh, stable periodic orbits. Have you studied the orbits that go uh, around the L4 and L5? And uh, have you found that uh, they are chaotic or? Uh, uh, well, for this potential, uh, no, because uh, the potential is in is definitely inaccurate uh, after a, a radius of approximately 10 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy. Okay. So uh, we do not have uh, what we need in order to study these orbits around L4 and L5. So you stop only the, yeah. the study for the bar? Only. Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, true, but there is something that's very interesting uh, here. If we can you just uh, show uh, any any kind of uh, any any one of these? Uh, let's get out of there. How do we go here? But this comes okay. down. No. Uh, okay. So look here. For instance, this is something very interesting because uh, L1 and L2 are up uh, up to this point here somewhere. If I point it correctly, somewhere there, roughly here and there, L1 and L2. So whatever has to do with the so-called uh, chaotic uh, uh, spirals is this part of here where I go through my yes. with, with the cursor. But here you, you see that we have strong features close to the end of the bars inside corrotation, inside corrotation. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, will be in the next- Inside the in, Inside corrotation, yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, okay, as Stavro said, when we underline that also in the paper, we do not want to model the specific galaxy. And the main reason for that is that this galaxy is very unsymmetric. It's, uh, it's the, the so-called scorpion because one of the arms goes very low and this is symmetrized. So it's not the galaxy, but we still can do some comparisons. And if and if the the 27 kilometers per second per kiloparsec omega is the one that uh, has been proposed uh, in that PhD thesis is correct, then certainly the the arms of this galaxy, or at least part of the arms of the galaxy, are inside corrotation, and then they join the other the other one at larger distances, and they form part of them at the outer parts of the arc of the spiral arms being has also contribution by the chaotic uh, spirals. It's something that has to be uh, investigated in detail in a number of uh, galaxies. Uh, but the next... galaxies are going parallel to the- Yes, yes, spiral. but these are here. So... These are not this, this, uh, this uh, spirals, if you want to call it like this here, but it's something over there. See? They are going parallel. So here, here, yes, uh, but here not. Okay. He, oh, he, here, oh. here, it's a, it's the one that can you see? So one of the landscape. Uh, uh, yeah. With the, the... Uh, or the other one. So the yes, pages are so nice. Look here, how they go. They are coming like this. You have this here. You have increased density. So this part is going this way. 
this part is going that way. Here they join, and over there, yes, at this particular one and the other one, they, they are parallel. But the flow here is neither chaotic nor it's 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 another thing that it is. You cannot tell. You can tell, but it is not the one that it is the, the known from the chaotic spiral case, just the outer part of it. Here you can see that it goes like parallel, but in here it is it changes, it goes like this, and you have this funnel that goes all the way. So it's that doesn't just it's not just the contribution of this flow from here, but you have also flow that's coming from that way. So it's in two different directions. Okay. So, uh, anyone else wants to ask something? Yeah. No, no, we have this. <laughs> it's someone else from uh, the people who are joining from the internet who wants to ask a question. No, I don't see anyone. Uh, no, there is no raised hand. So if not, then thanks again.